Hello, 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 everybody, and welcome to One Shot Church. My name is Darius Oxley. I'm happy to be a servant leader here today to share a little bit of what's on my heart. Um, We are in the middle of a series known as Why Church, right? So my job today is to uh, explore some of the things that God has put on my heart, and I wanted to open that up with a prayer. So uh, join me as we pray really quickly. Uh, Dear God, thank you for this day and for this opportunity to share. We really don't take it lightly to be in your presence together, Lord God, and what we're doing house churches now. We we want to connect with you um, in any way that we can, and we really want to hear um, exactly what you have for us, Lord God. I pray that we remove all distractions um, and that we can be able to totally focus on the things that you have for us, Lord God. Challenge us in a new way as we hear uh, your word today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So uh, I'm going to get started today, and I wanted to start off by talking a little bit about the series that we're in. So you might have heard some of the other ser- sermons um, in this series, and you might not have, so I'll give you a little bit of an um, overview. So in this sermon series, we're talking at and we're looking at about why church, right? So we start, not why Jesus, we all know why Jesus, because he's, you know, hashtag the goat, but it's why church? Like what, what does the church play, and what is the role of the church in my relationship with Jesus. So we're trying to figure out exactly how uh, we're supposed to connect and navigate both of those spaces. Um, Why go to church? Why connect? Why commit? All of those things uh, are exactly what we're trying to look through in this sermon series. So my series or my sermon is going to be called The Sojourner's Truth, right? So, um, So when we start talking about church and church community, a lot of people aren't really sure exactly why they need church right and they do need it regardless whether they see it or not but exactly why they do need church they say ah i can do it myself i i know i know exactly what um what i'm supposed to be doing i know exactly what is here and, and you start fooling around with other people things get a little bit sticky other people's um business gets into the church and not everybody enjoys that um but everybody enjoys jesus so they say i can i can do exactly what i have for me so people take their own life and they say, ah, this is exactly what I want. This is the, exactly the plan that I think I'm going to follow. And what they are saying while they're saying that, not in those uh, words, are saying that I think my plan is better than the plan that God has for me. And we're going to explore exactly what that looks like um, and exactly where God lays out that there is a plan for you to go to church and you to connect in a certain way. Um, not you, us to go to church and for us to connect in a certain way, regardless of what I say um, I believe and regardless of what I don't believe, I really am supposed to connect with the people who are here. Um, so God has given us a plan and a community we need to execute both individually as well as collectively. Many people don't have a problem with God has a plan for my individual life. God, everybody knows God has the plan for me, Jeremiah 29, 11. But God also has a plan for us collectively. And the only way for us to execute a collective plan is for us to work together. And the only way we can work together is if we know each other. So before we get too far, far ahead of ourselves, uh, I'm going to start with a story um, that's in the Bible in the Old Testament. I mean, if you know it, you know it. But otherwise, uh, let's see if we can catch this connection. I'm going to start off reading in 1 Samuel chapter 8. So before I get into too much about the, the, the reading, uh, excuse me, actually, I'm going to talk and give, give a little bit of synopsis. So God has his chosen people and his chosen people, um, the Israelites, they were in slavery at one point in Egypt. You guys maybe have seen the Prince of Egypt. After they've been brought out of Egypt, um, God does all of these things to bring them out of Egypt. He, um, he's proving that he is the man that he says that he is. Um, so he brings them out of Egypt and the people uh, were not satisfied. They were not happy. Uh, eventually they walked through the, the desert for years and years and still not satisfied, not happy. They blame God. All this type of stuff happens, um, and we pick up with Samuel, who is their spiritual leader at this point. But Samuel led the people, and it's time now for Samuel to to to, to pass on his um, his leadership because he's starting to get old. So I'm going to start reading in uh, verse four of First Samuel chapter eight. Well, there's one other thing that I wanted to highlight. Um, they were thankful to not be in slavery. They weren't thankful to God for bringing them out of slavery. There was a mis um, a misidentification of what they should have been uh, thankful for. So instead of being thankful for the person, they were thankful for, okay, yes, no more slavery. So now they're in the same mindset, but they're just not in slavery. So they still haven't realized exactly who God is to them and the relationship and the position that he should have in their life. 
So as they're looking and talking to Samuel, Samuel's a prophet, so he's the one that connects them directly to God. He was the one that would make the sacrifices. He's the one, the, the one that, that would uh, listen and talk to God and talk on their behalf, and they, they would uh, bring back and forth. So he was like their conduit. So um, Samuel gets old, and now Samuel is supposed to, uh, he, he hears from the people in chapter 8, verse 4. He says, Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. Verse 5, and said to him, Behold, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. According to all the deeds that they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods. So they are also doing it to you. Now then, obey their voice. Only shall solemnly, only you shall sol solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. All right. So you guys are probably wondering, what does this have to do, right, with, what does this have to do with the church? Um, and, and we'll get to that. But these were God's chosen people, and they still didn't want the things that God wanted for them. So kind of you can see a little, a little parallel that I'm going to start to draw what people want. I want to be able to do church on my own and what God wants. Um, I'm, I want to be the head. I want, to, I want you guys to live under me. I want you guys to teach me as your king. Um, and people still, even in the old times, they wanted to do things their own way. They said, okay, I can still connect to God when I want him or when he needs me and when, when I want something from him. But um, it, wasn't, it wasn't going to be that way forever. Right. So let, let's continue. They didn't want uh, a God over them. They didn't want a king. They wanted uh, to be able to come and go as they pleased, like the other nations did. Um, they wanted to uh, be seen how the other nations were, because imagine they have a king. This king kills hundreds of people. He's feared among all the lands. And your Egypt is just a kingless nation. People still they feel as though uh, being kingless means that the presence on the earth wasn't didn't strike fear into the hearts of other people. So um, the nation of Israel wanted to be known like the other people. So you start to see they start to be distracted and pulled away from the person who was and gives them everything that they have, right? So they wanted to rule in a more human and more clear direction. People see about being in a human and a clear direction because God will easily tell you um, all the time exactly what you're supposed to do. Wink, wink. It's, it's not that easy all the time following God versus following a king. If you have a king and the king says, okay, this is what we're doing. We're going to go invade this land, yada, yada, yada. You listen to the king because the king's in charge. Now, um, if you don't have a king, you're not really sure all the time exactly what you're supposed to be. You have to stay connected to your source of everything. The people don't want to be connected to God in that way. They don't want to be handicapped. They don't want to be dependent on a king. That's not humanly. They want to be known just like the other nations are known. Right? And God would eventually give them exactly what they asked for, and it would turn out the same way he highlights. So I'm going to jump now into 1 Samuel chapter 12, uh, verses 12 through 15. So in verse 12 it says, And when you saw that Nahash, the king of the Ammonites, came against you, you said to me, No, but a king shall reign over us, when the Lord your God was king. Verse 13, And now behold the king whom you have chosen, for whom you have asked, behold, the Lord has set a king over you. If you will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, and if both you and the king who reign over you follow the Lord your God, it will be well. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord but rebel against his commandment of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you and your king. So, I didn't say, um, but the king they ended up being appointed was Saul. So Saul um, becomes king and not too long after... <laughs> Just like it says in these verses, right? If you follow exactly what your if your king follows exactly the commandment of the law, there'll be no issues. Um, but if not, you're going to be against God. You guys are going to have some beef with God, right? And um, this brings me to my first point, right? I want to say it's critically important who we follow is following the instructions from Christ. So instead of us being directly connected to God through a church, um, we can have other connections. We can listen to and be influenced by other people, 
Um, and, and that's not all the time a bad thing. Like, as you can say here, if in verse 13, if you fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, if both you and your king who reigns over you will follow the Lord your God, it will be well. So um, if you go to a church where the leaders and everyone obeys just like it says here, then it's not going to be an issue. But if you start finding yourself in a place where you, it's not, it's not all the way directly um, following what God has, then it's going to end up being an issue, right? So it's very, it's critically important for us to know that the person we are following is going to end up following the instructions of God. And Saul, for the people of Israel, after they begged God and, and Samuel tried to tell them, no, you don't want a king. After they begged God, give us a king, give us a king. Um, Saul ends up um, <laughs> not, not being it, right? So he ends up being the king, but not following exactly what he says after he professes. And I'm trying to give you like the Cliff Notes version because there's two chapters, I mean, two books worth of, uh, for birth of material that I wanted to try and get through, right? But God didn't leave his people when Saul started to worship himself, right? So he sought a new leader who was after the heart of God, right? And people know this to be David, right? So um, David um, ended up being the answer uh, as a king um, before or after Saul was a, not able to execute exactly what God needed him to. So Saul was a king. Uh, the only issue was he was the ruler instead of God being the ruler. So Saul was starting to do things his own way, and God was not happy with that. And eventually the uh, spirit of the Lord left Saul, right? So he starts... Um, Samuel starts looking for another king. He eventually finds um, David, son of Jesse, brings him back. Then he anoints David to be king. I'm giving you guys like the short, short version. So David um, ends up defeating the Goliath, the giant. You guys might know that story. Um, you might not know, but Saul ended up being tormented by evil spirits, and David would play his instrument, and the, the evil spirits would leave him. He killed hundreds of thousands of Philistines, right? He married his daughter, and he was loved by his son, right? But it's not enough, but it wasn't enough, right? For us just to follow God alone. So David wasn't, it wasn't enough for David just to be in this position and just love um, and just follow and just do everything that God had him for him to do because God wanted more for him. He wanted um, people to be listening to him and, and to put him in the position so that he can actually be of influence, right? And, and at this point, this is... This is exactly what um, many people would say. This is exactly why you don't want or you don't need a church because you join a church. The, the leaders might not uh, take you exactly where you're supposed to go. And because of that, right, there's too much drama. I already know it says here that if the leaders aren't going, we're going to have beef with God. So that's why people say, oh, I don't need church. Or I'm, I'm not going to do it. Right. This, the people can be toxic. It could be a, a bad environment, but that's not the, the highest plan. And so. When I, when I was writing this, it made me think of a Kobe Bryant commercial uh, where he's, he's having a conversation with Kanye West. And um, he was like, how many records can my records break? More records. He said, but I'm the best. But are you a different animal and the same beast? It's like nobody knows what Kobe Bryant was talking about. But like the, the God had more for them, just like Kobe Bryant wanted more for Kanye. <laughs> um, so David was pursued by people he thought were his friends. So eventually David, um, Saul catches on that, ah, David, he's a little too well-liked. David is a, too, a little too good at his job. I got to remove the competition. So Saul wants to kill David. And as a result, um, so David goes into hiding. And this is the part um, that I want to highlight. And this is, this is kind of where I got the title of, of my sermon from. So David starts going from place to place. And he doesn't really have a place that he can call home. He's following God, but he didn't have a location where he could lay his head to be safe because he was on the run from Saul. So in avoiding um, like what the people called their leader, in avoiding uh, like organized organizations, like I guess I'm using quotes right now, um, David was avoiding those things, but he didn't have a home, but he was still trying to be in the will of God. But that wasn't his highest um, calling. Right. So David ended up being pursued by the people who loved him to kill him. Like um, Saul 
and was would, would be talking to David. I think there's even stories where Saul's hurling a spear at David to kill him. It's like, I can't be around this guy. He's going to try and kill me, right? But David actually had relationships with others and not just random people, but he had a very strong relationship with Jonathan, who was the son of Saul. So uh, he ended up making a covenant with Jonathan, um, two covenants, right? Which connected them for life. So this is even showing the need or the value in having a relationship with other people. Uh, as you start to say, like, oh, I, I want to just be um, my own Christian. I want to do my own thing. I can, I can do that. But you can even start to see the value in um, having a connection with someone else and having a connection with someone that you trust. So David ended up trusting uh, Jonathan. There's, there's stories here about that. And I, I'm going to read um, from 1 Samuel 20, verses 12 to 17. In verse 12, it says, Jonathan said to David, The Lord, the God of Israel, be a witness. When I have sounded out my father about this time tomorrow or the third day, behold, if he is well disposed toward David, shall I not then send and disclose it to you? But if it should not please my father for... But if it should please my father to do you harm, the Lord do so to Jonathan and more also, if I had not disclosed it to you, send you away, that you may go in safety. May the Lord be with you and he, as he has been with my father. So Jonathan is making a, um, a statement saying, I'm going to check with my dad to see if he's trying to kill you or not. If he is, I'm going to let you know. Right, so in verse 14, if I am still alive, show me the steadfast love of the Lord that I may not die. And do not cut off your steadfast love from my house forever when the Lord cuts off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. And Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, May the Lord take vengeance on David's enemies. And Jonathan made David swear again by his love for him, for he loved him as he loved his own soul. So Jonathan said, okay, if my dad is trying to kill you, I'm going to let you know. But I really need, I want you to know that, like, I'm not beefing with you. Like, I see, like, very clearly, like, you're a man of God. I see very clearly there's a connection. There was a commitment to each other. And um, they upheld their commitments to each other. Eventually, Jonathan ends up dying. And David honors his, uh, his family just in, in their commitments, right? And that was because they built up so much time. They built up so much um, experience with each other. And that can be one way that we can find um, church experience, right? You say, why church? Okay, that's one way. You build up enough experience with some people, and then you can do church with them. The issue is sometimes we don't have the experience with people to build up. We don't have the time to build up with people. We might just be moving into a new space. We might be leaving another space that was toxic, and we might not have um, enough time to build that history, right? So, uh, for much of David's next years, he lived as like a sojourner moving from place to place, honoring this statement because Jonathan ended up warning him about his father. Uh, many of us live this way and we feel like people are out to get us, right? And as a result, we deceive ourselves into thinking that we can take care of us better than God. So it's like, I'll just move solo because moving with a group it wasn't, it's not, it's not it. I get targeted when I move as a group. And I want us to remember that this all started because the people wanted a king. The people wanted a king. And it wasn't supposed to happen this way, right? But people wanted a king to lead them. And because they had a king lead them, there was some um, interruptions between their relationship with God and the people. People started, uh, Paul started, Saul started pulling people further and further away uh, from the direction God wanted. And as a result, God left and he started being, his, his, his spirit was with David. But thankfully, we saw David connect with a covenant, uh, but this covenant was based on like the works or the experience. Uh, our covenants, which we live by, are much better. We can trust our lives into them, like we can support our loved ones in them, and we can give out of the abundance to other people based on the covenant that we have, not, not based on the covenant of getting something done because of work or experience. Even in Hebrews 8, it talks about like, Christ coming to offer us a better covenant. So as you see, we, we start looking at people wanting to do things their own way. They want their own king, and then they end up being um, pulled into disorder, like Shannon's message. Um, but God not only wanted us initially to have a certain commitment, 
but he redeemed us and gave us a better covenant in um, Hebrews 8. It talks about that newer covenant, right? So we have in Christ been given everything we need, right? Just to do what though? That's the question. Not to hop from location to location still. We don't still have to follow uh, running around, looking over our shoulders, trying to avoid people, trying to avoid committing um, because we're not sure of what happens or we have had bad experiences. And I'm not saying that these bad experiences didn't happen and I'm not saying that um, they're not real and they're not hurt. I'm saying that God still calls for a higher. He wants more, like Kobe Bryant said, more records, right? So I wanted to read um, another verse to see what was the commitment now and where does it come from that we have in Jesus when we, when we say, okay, I want to be a Christian. There's a commitment and there's the things that we buy into. Um, and let's read into that. So in Hebrews 10, verses 14 through 25, and I, and I kind of, I tried to trim it down, but I like these chunks so much. It says in, in 10, 14, it says, For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us for after saying, verse 16, And this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and write them in their minds. And then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Verse 18, Where there is a forgiveness of these, there, no, there is no longer any offering for sin. And then in verse 19, Therefore, brothers, since we have a confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh. Verse 21, And since we have a great priest over our house of God, which is Jesus now, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from the evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Verse 23, Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he promise for he who promised is faithful verse 24 and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works not neglecting to meet together as it is a habit of some but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near all right so in our covenant with god it very clearly states right our covenant right let us draw near right with our hearts sprinkled there's a group written through all these passages and there's no group when you move from place to place without being able to connect without spending that time to really see and to really get to know the people who are um, the people who are worshiping God in those spaces and a lot of times it might be uh, hard to open up yourself but I think I, I want to push us and say that we have to in order for our hearts to be sprinkled let us draw near you can't just expect other people to do it, and it might be hard, and it might be difficult, and I'm not saying it isn't. But I'm saying the expectation is when we have this new covenant, right, it's made on better promises, right, that it's, we don't have to wait for the experience to prove that other people, oh, this person is someone I can trust, so now I will. No, it, it says, right, stir, one and up other, stir up one another to love and good works. So what I am doing it encourages you. In order to love and experience love, right, it pushes itself forward, right? Uh, the second point I really wanted to highlight was that Christ has determined the relationship, right? He says very clearly, like, this is the commitment that we have now to one another. So David honored his covenant with Jonathan, right? And um, all the more that we get to honor uh, our covenant that we have with Christ, right? So we honor our covenants, we make, but we need to realize the covenant we made with Christ for our freedoms, which we enjoy, right, comes with the relationships of others who are also enjoying those. So many are difficult and hard to manage, but we have to approach them with the idea that these are necessary. These relationships are necessary, and I do have to join a church because this is exactly what God asked me to do. When, I, when the people of Israel said, no, we want a king, we want to live like everyone else, it was very clear exactly what happened. He warned them. I should have read the warning. He warned them. You're gonna have. He's gonna take. He's gonna take. He's gonna tax. He's gonna get. People said, "No, we want a king," and they got their king. And it, exactly what happened happened. But it is necessary to have those experiences. It's necessary, right, to to build each other up, not neglecting as some other people do, 
like we read in those verses, right? So in closing, I, I do want to read one other message because I, I do think it's important for us to realize that like our life and, and our time here is, is hard work. And we are going to get rewarded for every piece of hard work that we do. But I want us to remember that the impact of our life helps other people be able to get to where they're trying to go. And when you are helping others, um, that is both a giving and a receiving, right? Because then others will help you in the time, but you don't do it in order to receive, right? But it's a machine, it's a cycle that pushes itself forward. So if you're helping others, people are able to um, believe in themselves and in turn, they will be able to respond in love, right? They are more, more apt to respond in love when uh, both sides are responding properly, right? So in closing, there's one passage I did want to make sure I shared um, because I had so much on my heart. I, I, I couldn't put it all, but I wanted to leave us with, with this passage. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, verses 21 through 27, they read, The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the he head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the great honor and unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, for which our more presentable parts do not require. But God, who has composed the body, giving honor, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, and that there be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now, in verse 27, you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Uh, I really liked that last verse because um, we get to see there is both the individual and the corporate that need to be happening, that need to be pursued at, at one time. We can't do our individual, we can't be individually in the will of God and not corporately. We have to have both, right? So why church? Because it's a requirement in our covenant that we read about in um, Hebrews 10. Um, so much I want to say and remind us of, right, of the covenant we are celebrating with other people is just as important as celebrating in our own. Um, I, I was so happy I got to use that, um, that David sermon, but let me pray for you guys as I head out. Dear God, I thank you for this opportunity. I thank you that, um, that you were able to use me in a way that um, challenges myself as well as uh, challenges your people. Uh, we pray that we continue to read more into uh, and study your word so that we can be exposed to everything that we agree with and everything that we struggle with so that we can lead um, healthy lives and that we can draw closer and closer to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.